We've got a really great chat lined up. So, uh, so let's, let's get started. <laughs> So today we're going to be riding, so we're still on day four of our Thailand eight day bike ride. Um, we are riding stage three of the four, four stage leg. And um, this is the, the, again, it's beautiful coastal, a um, little bit of highway and, and, you know, going through the plantations again. Um, but we're heading towards the rest day in Thailand. So, um, so it's always, very much anticipated. It's a, it's, it's a good afternoon when you're rolling in and, and you know that you've got a day off the bike. So today I'm joined by Pete and Dr. Ross Walker. Now, Dr. Ross Walker, he's an eminent practicing cardiologist with a passion for people and health. He's considered one of the world's best keynote speakers and life coaches. Ross places a particular emphasis on preventative cardiology and works to raise public awareness of heart health. He is the author of seven books, including the bestseller, Diets Don't Work, and he lectures extensively on preventative health topics such as how to discover perfect sleep and the five-point way to a healthy life. Dr. Walker contributes regularly to medical journals and publications, has appeared on a variety of television programs locally and internationally, as well as hosting a national radio show called Healthy Living that goes live every Sunday night on Macquarie Radio. Here to talk health, heart and fitness is Dr. Ross Walker and Pete. Over to you guys. Uh, thanks, CT. Welcome, uh, Ross. How are you this morning? How's the, uh, let the audience know uh, you're a bit uh, immobile at the moment. I'm moderately immobile. About three weeks ago, or three weeks ago yesterday, I had a, a total knee replacement. I, one of those stupid old farts that played soccer and squash till I was 52. So that was 12 years ago, and I've been battling with bone-on-bone -bone arthritis in my right knee for 12 years, and the last three months just been horrendous with pain. So I thought I'll bite the bullet. So I had robotic surgery on my knee three weeks ago. I'm um, back. I, I'm, I'm off crutches, just on a walking stick now. I've got pretty good mobility, but the pain's still there. So, But the pain's getting less every day. So very happy I had the procedure, and I'm looking forward to chatting with everyone today. And uh, Ross, what kind of uh, a patient is, uh, is a doctor? <laughs> well, I've got to say, personally, most of my worst patients are typically doctors because they're arrogant, pains in the butt of the day, listen to a word I tell them. Um, but I've, I've tried to be a patient. I just do what my wonderful orthopedic surgeon with the very appropriate last name of Limbers. So uh, Dr. Limbers Limber. operated on me and he's given me a wonderful service. I had a terrific service at the Sydney Women's <laughs> Hospital and I've had very good post-operative physiotherapy. For, but for anyone who's listening to this, who's considering a hip or a knee replacement, my one plea to all of you is to do the prehab and the rehab. Now I was uh, over my shoulder, I showed Peter before my own exercise bike and I was doing 20 Ks in 40 minutes most days of the week on the bike before the operation. Didn't give me a huge amount of pain, although it hurt going up and down stairs. Uh, and so my legs were like tree stumps before the operation. So giving myself the best prehab and then I've been doing all the exercises I've been advised to do since, which means I'm getting good mobility and still some pain, but the pain, as I said, is getting less. Yeah, wonderful, Ross. I look forward to uh, uh, the community consult that you're about to lead us through. But before we get into that, it'd be just nice to uh, learn a bit more about, uh, about yourself. We... We first met uh, in San Francisco. We yep. were both over there with uh, Nasha and uh, uh, Kay Spencer um, invited us both across to uh, speak at a conference there. And I've got to tell you, uh, Ross, meeting uh, Nasha and that wonderful organisation has certainly uh, uh, shaped a lot of lives uh, for the kids in Thailand in a very positive way. So it was a wonderful conference, not just for meeting you. Well, you may remember back then, Pete, in San Francisco, I'd, I'd just ruptured my Achilles tendon on the left side, so I was in a moon boot in San Francisco. But, but you mentioned Nata and Kay Spencer. I, I, I can't remember meeting a better group of people than the Nata people. What, they, what they've not, not just done for, in, in the business world, but what they do for charity, what they've done with you, in my view, has been extraordinary. And, and everyone I've met, I, I've had these long-term friends now people like yourself and Kay and many other people, good old, my mate Lionel Lee from Bing Lee, all, all these 
wonderful people who I've become long-term friends with because of NATA. And, and I've had some extraordinary experiences speaking in wonderful places all over the world for NATA. And, and you might recall uh, they had Sugar Ray Leonard uh, closed out the conference and Tom Mitchell, uh, who was with the uh, at the time, he uh, got the opportunity to go up on stage with Sugar Ray and have a photo and he passed it over to me and Tom's actually fully embraced uh, this ride that we're on here and uh, he's uh, committed on the Gold Coast riding up and down the main beach uh, with his dog. Uh, how do you say his dog's name, CT? Uh, Regazzo. Regazzo. <laughs> I'm sure it means something. In... And uh, yeah, so as you say, those, those uh, friendships and uh, so forth uh, continue long into today. So let's go back a little bit, Ross. Uh, uh, where did you grow up and uh, what was your, your childhood uh, uh, like? I had a, well, I, I grew up in the beautiful Maroubra. I'm still a very strong South Sydney supporter. Um, in fact, a fellow called Clive Churchill organised my engagement party. John O'Neill and Ivan Jones were in the, the Magic South team of the late 60s, early 70s, came to my wedding. And uh, so I'm a Maroubra boy through and through, but uh, had a very happy and simple childhood. Uh, I went to school. Um, I lived in Anzac Parade for 21 years in Maroubra. I went to school in Anzac Parade, Sydney Boys High. Went to university in Anzac Parade, University of South Wales. And I did my hospital training in Anzac Parade at Prince Henry. But then after that, uh, my, my wife and I got married very early. And so we, I was 21 when I got married, Peter, which is quite bizarre. Right. And a couple of years later, we had our first child. We've now had five children since. My first wife is still my first wife and will be my first wife for another 30, 40 years. So we've been together for 45 years, married for 43 years in August. Um, so I've had a happy childhood, a very wonderful marriage with five kids and now eight grandchildren. Um, and I've, I've had a, a blessed life. I, I love my job. It's still my hobby. So people say to me, Ross, when are you retiring? The answer is when somebody dra drags me out in a box. Um, I have no yeah. desire to retire. So whilst ever I believe I'm continuing to give a good service and my brain is staying as sharp as I hope, as it, hope it is, I'll keep working because I just love working. It's just what I do and it's my fun. It's what I enjoy. Um, and, and, and I've had this blessed life where I don't just work as a cardiologist, but I do a whole lot of other things, as you say, such as a professional speaker and I have my own radio show. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a great life and it will continue to be a great life. And Ross, was there uh, uh, from a, a history within the family of, of uh, practicing medicine or was it something that uh, uh, you were a groundbreaker in? Oh, look, I'm, I'm the only person in my family who, who, who's medical. Um, I think probably the reason I had to become a doctor is my family's just so neurotic. And uh, <laughs> so uh, it's my family I was born into. So my mother was, I, I can remember spending half my life in the GP surgery and I've had so many courses of antibiotics. I'm sure it's completely destroyed my gut microbiome. <laughs> um, but uh, I, as a kid, I just loved science. I remember my mum bought me a book when I was about seven years old on the atom. And I just read this book and it just excited me at the age of seven. And I had my own chemistry set and I was thinking I'll become a chemical engineer or something like that. But then got to about 15, 16 at school and I thought, you know what? Why not become a doctor? I mean, and there's just so many wonderful yeah. aspects to medicine. You, you, I've had patients now for 30, 40 years I've been looking after. And now, now I'm looking after their children. And so they're, they're almost like family to me, these beautiful people. I don't do any hospital work anymore. I gave up hospital work about 15, 16 years ago. So I just have my chronic practice, where, which is basically a preventative cardiology practice and do all the other things outside of it. So, so I... 15, 16, I decided I wanted to be a doctor, worked hard at school, got into medicine, and it's, uh, the rest is history, really. And where did you do your res res residency? I did my residency at Prince Henry, Prince of Wales Hospital. Um, right. And, and that's where I became, it was, I was the senior registrar there in cardiology. And, and then I left there, strangely, at, at the age of 29 and became a specialist in Coffs Harbour. So we'd already had three little children by that stage. So it was either going over and following the professorial route, going to the Mayo Clinic or going to some, some big wig hospital in London and, and get your extra training there, do a PhD. And I thought to myself, you know, I've already got three little kids. I wanted to be a father. So my wife and I did, 
we did the country thing for about eight years. So I was the cardiologist in Coffs Harbour for the first eight years of my career. But then when the kids started to become teenagers, I thought they're going to stream out of our lives going to boarding school. And so we'll be sitting up here in our flash house looking over the ocean, but not have any relationship yeah. with the kids. So I came back to Sydney in, in 1994 and built up a practice in Sydney. And, it's, and again, just from there, I've been in Sydney s since then, but live now on the North Shore of Sydney rather than back in Maroubra. Even though you can take the yes. boy, out of, you can take the boy out of Maroubra, you can't take the Maroubra out of the boy. Thus, my still love of South Sydney. And is there a uh, bra boy tattooed underneath that night oh. shirt you've got on there, Ross? Oh, of course. No, no, no. I'd, no <laughs> I think I don't. I'm not a great believer in tattoos. As one a friend of mine once said, "Why put a bumper sticker on a Bentley?" So no, yeah. no. There's no tattoos. So the decision to go into uh, cardiology was it a head or heart decision oh, I was a, a head head decision to go into the heart basically because when I looked at that I look, being a general practitioner is a very difficult job you've got to know a yeah. little bit about a huge amount so as a GP you don't know whether you're going to see a sore throat a runny nose a marriage breakup a broken leg uh, whereas as a cardiologist you can go you can drill down into into subjects and and I've had the privilege of really becoming a, a significant expert in things like preventative cardiology. I introduced in 1999 into Australia a thing called coronary calcium scoring, which is the best way of assessing the heart. Uh, so so with cardio cardiology to me is a really clean specialty. I don't get my hands dirty. I don't do any invasive procedures. I'm not an interventional cardiologist, so I don't put in stents or treat heart attacks. I basically prevent them. And I sit, I sit there and talk to people, which I love doing. I, I love a microphone or I love sitting in front of a patient. That actually leads me into the next uh, uh, question I want to explore with you is, you're certainly not uh, the typical uh, medical practitioner or cardiologist. You spend a lot of time uh, traveling the world speaking and not just what people might think at industry related events. You, uh, most of your work uh, from a speaking point of view, is to a much broader audience, to corporates, uh, businesses, and and so forth, associations, uh, very much uh, NATA um, mm. as an as an example. Uh, on top of that, there's the frequent uh, television and the nightly uh, seven on Sunday, the nightly uh, uh, radio program that you have. Uh, what's taken you uh, down that route? Uh, rather than confining yourself uh, to a practicing cardiologist? Well, th there's a few reasons there, mate. F firstly, uh, I mean, at, at a purely self-absorbed personal level, I love a microphone. I mean, I'm a ham, as you, you've yeah. seen me built out Mustang Sally and all the other things that I've done. I used to be in a rock band when I was younger. So any one of my mates once said, Ross Walker's never met a microphone he doesn't like. So, so <laughs> I... I do enjoy a microphone. I do enjoy performing. That's one thing. And, and probably in my early 30s, that, this is a true story, I, I used to do professional comedy. So I, um, I was down in Canberra at a cardiology meeting sitting next to a guy and I started launching into my Bob Hawke impersonation. And he goes, oh, that's fantastic. You've got to do it for everyone. So there's a thousand people in the audience with this microphone shoved in front of my face and I had to launch into Bob Hawke. So then the drug companies used to employ me professionally to come and do <laughs> sessions of comedy. And one of the funny, funniest ones was I was at a, a conference up in the Blue Mountains in, in uh, New South Wales. And um, I, I, was doing, I was doing the Bob Hawke thing. So I had, had the wig and the eyebrows and I had to go out and put the whole, whole regalia on and get the makeup on. And I was sitting at a table with a bunch of Queensland cardiologists. And I, I, I just ducked out and got the thing on. Came and did the half an hour of comedy. Came back, had, ta had the, all the stuff taken off. I sat down, the guy said, where you been? You missed the comedian. He was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Which was, I was very happy that he didn't realise who I was. But then what happens, I was, I was asked in 1994 to give a talk for the Food Media Corporation. So just give, give a talk about heart health on food. So I said, oh, this would be good. Got up and gave the talk. And then, then I was approached by Saxton Speakers Bureau 20 years ago, or 24 years ago now. Um, they said, look, we, we heard you're a pretty good speaker. Would you like to do this professionally? So I just really stumbled into it. And then I started to say, well, if I'm going to do this, you've got to have a few products around that. So I wrote a book called If I Eat Another Carrot, I'll Go Crazy. And so I wrote a book on nutrition and health. 
And then I was asked to go on TV and talk about it. And they said, look, would you like to come on and do some more sessions on TV? So I had a, a regular spot on the Today Show until a couple of years ago when I decided that I just didn't want to get up that early and do it anymore. But kept, but I've, so I do a bit of TV still. Uh, but now I, I have a big presence on radio. I do probably three to four hours of radio every week, including my own show on a Sunday night and do as many talks as I can. Now with, with COVID-19, of course, as, as with your speaking as well, it's just been destroyed for the time being. And I was in the middle of a road show around Australia when the COVID thing hit. And so that was canceled. Um, and, 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 but I just, I love doing the speaking. And I think at a, at a non-personal level, if I sit in front of one patient, I'm, I'm affecting one person's life. But if I can stand there in front of an audience of 500 or 1,000, the biggest audience was 35,000 people in a cricket stadium in India. So when you get the chance to touch that many people's lives, just even getting some small messages about what is good health is really exciting. And so if you can get that message out there, I'll, I'll tell you one thing, Peter, I was at Sydney airport and I was walking down the stairs at Sydney airport, which I certainly couldn't do now. I'd use the escalator okay. right at the moment. But, um, but this guy walked up to me and said, doc, I said, oh, hello. And he said, uh, you know what I'm doing? I said, yeah, we're walking down the stairs. He said, but do you know why I'm doing it? I said, no. He said, I went to one of your talks 10 years ago and you said, never use the escalator. So I always use the stairs. And I thought, isn't that lovely? I've had other people say to me, I've given up smoking because of one of your talks. And in fact, the, uh, the, the very prominent ex-president of South Africa, F.W. de Klerk, gave up smoking after he listened to one of my podcasts, which I was pretty proud about. So, so to be able to get there and extend your, the educational health message throughout as, as many avenues as you possibly can, as I'm doing right now, is really, really exciting and it's an absolute privilege. Yeah, fantastic, Ross. I, I love the integrity behind your message that uh, it's the microphone, it's, uh, which is what leads you there, the love of the microphone. And uh, um, I want to turn to uh, something that... Uh, uh, I offered up to our riders would be a free uh, consult for them this morning. So uh, this is where uh, I want to uh, uh, go a bit deeper into your speciality and your sure. your thoughts on uh, general health and trends and so forth uh, at the moment and uh, uh, certainly where we're at from society level, what we can do. And, and uh, so you've got some strong views on... Um, uh, dieting and uh, so forth. Uh, yep. Uh, your book that you, you wrote. Um, what was the name of that one around diets? Well, or so diets, don't, diets don't work. Well, but I talk about going on a diet like you go on a holiday. What happens when you go on a holiday? You come home. What happens when you go on a diet? You stop. And when people yeah. cycle through these ridiculous diets, and I don't care whether they're paleo or Atkins or low fat, high fat, this fat, that, it's all nonsense. It's all absolute nonsense. Because what it is, is developing a lifestyle habits that will stay with you for the rest of your life. These 12 week programs, they're just complete nonsense because you go onto these programs, then you stop and you go back to where you were. So I think what, what I say yeah. to people, life isn't about making the big decision to be healthy. It's about making 30, 40, 50, 60 small decisions every day, decisions like, I'll walk up the stairs rather than take the escalators. I won't, I don't need to eat that biscuit, so I won't do it. I won't yell at that fool or just cut in front of me in the traffic. So the small decisions are the vital ones. And the problem with that, Pete, is you don't see any difference from those small decisions. So if you don't have that extra piece of ice cream or the biscuit, it doesn't make you feel yeah. any better 10 minutes later, apart from the, the, the moral stance you can take on it. But what happens after months and months of making those little decisions, then you see the change. And so what I talk about all the time, which is 80% is of anyone's management are what I call the five keys of being healthy. And this is in increasing order of importance up to number one. So starting at the first one, and this is the least important, but still very important, you cannot be healthy and smoke. So I don't care whether you can run a marathon and you smoke cigarettes. If you smoke cigarettes, you are sick. You cannot be healthy and drink too much alcohol. You cannot be healthy and use any illegal drugs whatsoever. And I, for example, 
People talk about the legalization of marijuana. Marijuana is a poison that should stay a poison. And I'm on the board of a company called MGC Pharmaceuticals that are developing medical cannabis around the world. Now I'm, I'm a complete supporter of medical cannabis, but I'm against the use of illegal drugs and I hope marijuana stays illegal throughout most parts of the world. Unfortunately, in places like Canada and the US, it, it's becoming legal. And I think that we will see long-term health consequences from that, which we've already seen from the use of illegal drugs, whether it be marijuana or heroin or cocaine or ecstasy or the worst one possible, which is that dreadful thing, ice. So number one, if you want to be healthy, don't have any addictions. Now, I'll ask you a question. I'll ask you a question, Pete. What is the, the most used drug on the world in the world? Alcohol? Nope. Coffee. Coffee. Okay. Yep, coffee. And, and the point is about coffee, for example, it is the most consumed drug in the world. But a couple of cups of coffee a day is actually good for you. So if you enjoy a couple of cups of coffee a day, you reduce your risk for gallstones, kidney stones, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, many common cancers, type 2 diabetes, depression, stroke, asthma, etc, etc, etc. So it's good to have a couple of cups of coffee a day. But once you push that beyond about five, then you increase your yep. risk for a heart attack by about 20%. So it's all about the dose. And it's the same thing with alcohol. If you enjoy a couple of glasses a day of red wine and the Walker suggested dose is 125 mils per glass. So if you enjoy a couple of glasses a day and you can stop at that, then you do have a weak but reasonable health benefit from enjoying those couple of glasses of alcohol, preferably red wine. But you do not- Ross, can I stop you there? Yeah, sure. Can I ask? Is there a difference uh, in the alcohol uh, intake for men and women? Oh, absolutely. Uh, great question. Absolutely. Unfortunately, and I'm sorry, ladies, I don't make the rules. Uh, a female tends to, be, tends to have a smaller body, body bulk than a male. The liver doesn't tend to be as efficient in terms of metabolizing alcohol. And so because of all of these factors, women probably should be consuming about half what men consume. So again, and here's, here's another issue. If you look at all the American data with alcohol, there is absolutely no benefit from having a couple of glasses of alcohol a day when you combine it with a crappy American diet. But when you go to the Mediterranean and they have a high quality diet, then you get a 50% reduction in heart disease and cancer by having one or two glasses of especially red wine per day, men or women. But if, for example, if you look at the data out of Harvard University, women who have one glass of red wine a day uh, or any sort of wine or any sort of alcohol have a 25% increased risk for breast cancer. And here's the weird thing, unless they also take a multivitamin, which negates the risk. So I think everyone from about the age 30 to 40 should be taking a multivitamin every day because it does reduce your risk for many things over a long period of time. In the short term, does absolutely nothing. It's so what I said, you've got to look at the long-term gain here, not the short-term gain. So, so, for example, with multivitamins, I'm sort of going off the, off the course a bit from what I wanted to say, but with multivitamins, up to 10 years, there's absolutely no benefit from taking multivitamin every day. But when you get to 10 years, and this was done in a, a thing called the Male Physicians Trial in the Nurses' Health Study, 180,000 people followed for 30 years, up to 10 years, there was in the doctors an 8% reduction in cataracts and common cancers by taking a multivitamin every day. Up to 15 years in the nurses, a 75% reduction in bowel cancer, 25% reduction in breast cancer, 23% reduction in cardiovascular disease, and negate the risk of having a glass of alcohol per day if you take the multivitamin. 20-year data in the males, 44% reduction in cardiovascular disease. So that's just another segue into, into vitamins. But getting back to the, the addictions, no addictions. And, ha and if you can't stop at two glasses of alcohol a day, you've got a problem with alcohol. Definition of an alcoholic, Peter, is someone who drinks more than their doctor. So I can assure you, you should be sticking to about two glasses a day. Now, the second thing is good quality sleep. And we don't talk enough about the health benefits of sleep. So if you can get seven to eight hours of good quality sleep per night, that is good for your body as not smoking. And some simple tips with sleep. Don't see alcohol as a sedative, because it isn't. It might get you off to sleep, but it completely screws your sleeping patterns. Don't have caffeine beyond about four o'clock. Now, again, here's the, here's the problem, and this, we could talk about this for hours, but, but we're all different genetically. So I have the gene that is a, 
makes me a slow metabolizer of caffeine. So if I have caffeine beyond about four o'clock, I'm still awake at two in the morning. But other, I know some people can go out for dinner and have a double shot latte before they go to sleep and it doesn't affect them at all. They're rapid metabolizers of caffeine. So having good quality sleep, sleep in a cool, dark room, all the electronics out of the bedroom and have a regular sleeping habit. Go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time every day of the week. Now, here's the problem. 70% of us are larks, which means we our genetic... Uh, program is to go to bed early, wake up early, 30% of night hours, go to bed late, wake up late. And you can't fight your genetics. So you find out which one you are, but get that seven to eight hours a night sleep habit. Number three, you've already alluded to, which is nutrition. And nutrition is very easy to talk about, harder to do. It's called eat less food, eat more natural food. And everyone should be having two or three pieces of fruit per day, three to five servings of vegetables per day. Now, a serving is about a half a carrot. So it's not a huge amount. You say, well, that's okay, Doc. If it's okay, how come less than 10% of people do it? And the people who do have yeah. the two or three pieces of fruit per day and the three to five servings of vegetables per day have much less rate, lower rates of heart disease and cancer than people who don't. And then on top of that, and there's a question just come through, on top of that, if you like, little bits of meat, eggs, dairy, chicken, fish, nuts, and olive oil. It's called the Mediterranean diet. It's the only diet in the world that has any proven long-term medical benefits. All these other fad diets, whether it be paleo or vegan or vegetarian, and I have nothing against people who want to be a vegetarian for animal rights reasons, totally respect that. But if, if you enjoy a bit of meat, there is no evidence that it hurts you unless you're someone who consumes a huge amount, amount of processed meat. So, for example, if, you're, if you have a bit of bacon every day or a bit of uh, Devon or, or whatever, the delicatessen meats every day that are all processed, you increase your heart disease risk by about 40%. But if you have good quality red meat once or twice a week, there's no evidence that it actually hurts you. And in fact, there's been a big trial called the PURE study 220,000 people followed for nine years in 50 different countries and showed, showed that if you had 100 grams of red meat per day and two to three servings of high fat dairy per day, you reduce your risk for death and cardiovascular disease over a nine year period by 25%. So if you hear any nutritionist or, or uh, cardiac foundation anywhere say that we should be avoiding our intake of saturated fat, they're not looking at the latest evidence. So the evidence shows that, that, for example, if you have the highest carbohydrate intake, what I call white death, sugar, white bread, rice, pasta, potatoes, goes straight to the gut. Now you'll say, hang on, Ross, what about Asians? Asians have a huge amount of rice. But the, those who have a traditional Asian diet might only take in between 1,200 to 1,500 calories a day. The average Australian, for example, Australian male, two and a half to three and a half thousand calories a day. And that's where the mix of these refined carbohydrates becomes bad for you. So this pure study showed if you had the highest intake of the refined carbohydrates, you had a 28% increase in death rate. The highest fat intake, and that's all fats, not just saturated fat, 23% reduction in, heart, in, in death and cardiovascular disease the highest intake of saturated fat, meat, eggs, and dairy, 14% reduction in death. So I, I, I just can't bear when people get bad nutritional advice. And the key is have the two or three pieces of fruit, three to five servings of vegetables and build around that. That should be the center of what you eat every day. So that's nutrition. Number four is something you're doing right at the moment, my friend, three to five hours every week of moderate exertion. And just by having a three to five hour a week exercise habit, that reduces your risk for cardiovascular disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, depression, and diabetes by 30%. Reduces your risk for osteoporosis by 50%. It drops your blood pressure and you sleep better. There's only one drug known to man that is better than exercise in terms of what is good for your body. You're reducing your risk for all diseases. And that's number five, and that's a thing called happiness. So people who are happy, people who enjoy their life, who manage their stresses better, because there's not one person listening to this who doesn't have stress. We all have stress living in this modern world, but it's the way you handle the stress and the way you manage your happiness that is easily the best drug on the planet. I'm talking tomorrow night in the show about the profound impact of loneliness 
on our health. And, and in fact, what this COVID-19 lockdown around the world has done has really brought out these issues in many people about the fact that we all need some form of social contact. Now, it's lovely to see you um, over the internet, but it's always better, I think, to see people face to face and talk with them. And sure. as professional speakers, you and I would much prefer to be in front of an audience of 500 than know that 10,000 people are watching us on the internet. Because of that, that, that being able to, to detect people's body language and, and see how they're responding to what you're saying is much more exciting than just talking down a, a, a video screen. So that human connection, in fact, this is a wonderful study out of Harvard University, again, a 75 year study showed the one key to health and happiness is to have someone else in your life who loves and cares for you, for you who you love and care for. And it's such an important message to get out there. Nurture the relationships with the people in your life that matter. I say often in my talks, Pete, put your effort into people who will be standing around your bed when you have your heart attack, because they probably won't if you don't. And they won't could be crying at your funeral if you haven't put the effort into those people. And, and that's, I mean, that, that to me is the greatest achievements in life. My greatest achievement in my view is the fact that my wife still loves me after 43 years of being together. We actually love each other's company. And that my, I just went up to see my son, who's the number one real estate agent for Ray White in Australia. And I uh, just went in there. He's in front of all these people. He still gives his dad, dad a kiss at, a, at an open home. You know? and, and, and that, that to me, is a much greater achievement than all the letters after your name or how many people you've spoken to or what you've done. And I think th this is the message I want to get there to anyone listening the most important thing you do is not focus on a damn number in your bloodstream like your cholesterol. Focus on your relationships and focus on your own internal happiness. So, oh, Russ, can I just say on that? That's it. Just oh. If you do those five things well, as well as you can, you reduce your risk for all diseases somewhere between 70 to 80%. If I give you a pill to lower your cholesterol or your blood pressure, I reduce your risk for one disease about 20 to 30%. Yeah. And uh, the advice is uh, so simple and uh, easy to implement. And uh, But as you say, if it's so simple, why aren't uh, more people doing it? I want to explore with you a couple of points, if I can, before we run out of time today. Uh, you talk about the benefits of exercise and... Uh, I'm assuming that you're not seeing uh, a lot of healthy uh, 20 uh, to 30 odd year old people come to you for a consult. I, I guess it's those who uh, are later in life and, mm. and uh, exercise hasn't been part of their life for a long time. And the thought of uh, taking something up can be intimidating. So can you talk about how someone who hasn't had exercise in their life for a long time yep. can bring it in and when do the benefits arrive? Okay. Well, firstly, I, I, I tend to have a slightly younger group of patients coming to see me. So for example, yesterday, first patient I saw was a 43 year old man whose father uh, had stents in his arteries in his sixties, his grandfather. So his paternal grandfather died at 48 of a heart attack. And this guy's cholesterol is 11, which is off the scale. Anything above four is bad, and his is 11. So he came to see me because he can't take the statin drugs to lower your cholesterol. Um, so I, obviously, I gave him the message about the five keys. I'm, I'm looking at his heart in a very deep way to see how much fat he already has in the walls of his arteries, to see what other things we can offer him to run that cholesterol lower, because he's got a condition called familial hypercholesterolemia, which is a pure genetic disorder of, of the arteries. Now, all disease, whether it be heart disease, cancer, high cholesterol, Alzheimer's, doesn't matter what it is, all disease is genetic. But your genes loads the gun, then your environment pulls the trigger. So I, yes, I am seeing a slightly younger people, but still most of the people I see are 50 plus who've come to me for advice because they don't want to go down the same line as their next door neighbor or their father or their mother or whatever. And the, the point about this is that before anyone starts on an exercise program, they must have an assessment of their heart. So I say to all people, just say you're, you're 48 years old, you put on a bit of weight, your father had a heart attack or a bypass at 70, and you're thinking, oh, what, what should I do? The first thing you do is you have what I spoke about before, a coronary calcium score, 
which is a big CT scan, a big open CT scan, not closed in like an MRI. And this takes a snapshot of your arteries, measures how much muck you've got in the wall of your arteries. Now, 50% of men age, age 50 have a zero calcium score. So they don't have muck in their arteries. They don't need cholesterol pills, regardless of their cholesterol level. But unfortunately, these days, for example, it's a knee-jerk reaction. You go into the doctor with a high cholesterol, you put on a pill. So what I do is I always ask, is there a lot of muck that spills into the wall? And we treat the, we treat the muck. Now, if I find someone has a high calcium score, then I would do a test called a stress echocardiogram, which takes a picture of their heart before and after exercise to see whether they already have blockages. Because the problem is 20% of heart disease, you have no symptoms at all. So I'll give you a great example, right. mate, because whilst you're on the bike, it just reminded me of this ongoing exercise. I had a 65-year-old man that wanted to walk the Kokoda Trail. And this is one yes. of those twilight zone moments. His daughter had a dream before he walked the Kokoda Trail that he died in the Kokoda Trail. So she insisted that he come in to see me for a, a check of his heart, did a stress echo on him, no changes at rest, his heart looked fine, the ECG looked fine, did normal exercise, no symptoms at all, the ECG still looked fine, but on my echo machine, his heart had almost stopped at the end of exercise. And I said, let's forget about the Kokoda Trail and think about the local hospital that I put him into. He had severe triple vessel disease and needed bypass surgery. He would have died in the Kokoda Trail. So if someone wants to start an exercise program, and we all should, because it doesn't matter where, what age you're at, Having that three to five hours a week of moderate exercise that suits you will reduce your risk for all the disease I've said. Now, obviously, the younger you start, the better. There's no doubt about that. But even if you're 60 and you've never really done much exercise, having the checkup first to see that you're well enough to start an exercise program and then just gradually getting into some sort of exercise. So uh, I've, we spoke before we came on air and I, I personally believe for us not that you're old, but for older people, the best exercise is an exercise bike because you can't fall off your bike. No one can run into you. You don't have to wear a helmet. doesn't matter what the weather's like. And you can pedal to your level. And again, with my crappy knee, I couldn't walk up and down stairs, but I could still do 20 Ks on the bike in 40 minutes. So I think it's an ideal form of exercise. Now, again, probably there's only one exercise better than that, and that's swimming, but I personally find that a bit boring. So... To have that ex to, to get on the exercise bike, and I watch television whilst I'm uh, I'm on the bike, or watch a medical show, or something like that. It you you get a couple of bangs for your buck. But the point is, you can just start off very very slowly after assessment and build it up slowly. I wouldn't want anyone to go. I'm going to do a 10k run. You've always got to do things slowly. You might just walk one block, then two blocks, and three blocks over over a period of time to build up to your exercise. Thanks, Russ. I've got three questions for you. Oh, and, I've got a uh, question from Brad. Yeah, uh, three questions for you. Uh, the and I'll give them to you all and you can answer them all uh, as you see fit. The first, when you spoke about uh, the addictions and uh, alcohol, cigarettes, uh, illegal drugs and so forth, is the medical profession uh, seeing uh, the negative impact of vaping? Uh, so e-cigarettes, that's yep. the first question. The second is uh, childhood obesity. Uh, does that concern you? Is it uh, something that as a society we should be deeply concerned and taking action on and marching up and down the streets against those that are providing that? And yep. the third question was the benefit of uh, taking naps during the day. So if you're not getting the eight hours at once, is there a benefit of having a nap during the day? Well, let's do the, the third question first, because that's easy. Study of 23,000 Greeks showed that those who had an afternoon sleep, so just a nap for 20 minutes, had a 23% reduction in cardiovascular disease. Sorry, 40% 40, 40 reduction in cardiovascular disease just by having an afternoon sleep. So an afternoon nap's a really good thing to do. The working Greeks, and there's not many of those left, but the working Greeks <laughs> a 50% reduction in cardiovascular disease. So yes, the naps are terrific for you. By all means, do that. You don't have to get it all, all the sleep in the one hit. And I wake up at the end of every sleep cycle, which goes for 90 minutes, but I get good sleep in between the cycles. So it's the quality of the sleep you get between the cycle. Getting on to vaping, oh, there's been a big deal over in the States in the last six months or so pre-COVID where people were, were vaping illegal marijuana 
which was mixed in this thing called vitamin C acetate, which was a fat. And so they were basically sucking fat into their lungs and getting this thing called lipoid pneumonia. So that's an extreme of vaping that you won't get to do the normal vaping people do here just to replace cigarettes. But again, I, I actually believe that we're seeing now a lot of the data that vaping is still not good for you. It's better for you than smoking. I mean, to me, smoking should just be wiped off the face of the earth. But I think that if people can just get off any, any form of inhalants, apart from their asthma sprays, it's better for you. I think your lungs are there. Strain, you'll, be, you'll be shocked by this, Pete. The lungs were designed for a funny thing called breathing, not to put a white <laughs> stick in your mouth or, a, a, or the vaping in your mouth and do that. So, so no, I still think there are some concerns with vaping, but it's not as bad as cigarettes. Getting on finally, because we're going to see we've only got two minutes to go. Uh, childhood obesity. Childhood obesity, without wishing to sound like I'm using a dreadful pun, is a huge problem and it's getting worse. And when you and I were kids, there was hardly any fat kids, but now these kids are getting fat. And why? Because they're eating so much processed packaged muck masquerading as, as food, so much sugary based drinks. And, and tragically, people are still consuming soft drinks. So say, for example, in the US, 50% of their sugar intake comes from soft drinks. So I think we, I personally believe that soft drinks should be regulated. I think energy drinks should be banned. I think that takeaway food outlets somehow should be managed better than they are because it's kids having these sugar based foods, the refined carbohydrates that are whacking on this weight. And we're now seeing little children becoming type two diabetics. So type one diabetes, which is where they start off on insulin from the start, that's one thing, but it's when the kids are, are consuming far too many of these sugary based uh, products and getting type 2 diabetes in their uh, late childhood or even early teens. This is a disgrace. And it's a disgrace. And where do they get the example from? They get it from their parents. Their parents allow, allow them to eat this food. There's no discipline. And, and this is where I think we've, we've got to start looking at our own personal responsibilities, but also as a society, what we're allowing it to happen. And unfortunately, so many people put profits above what is right. Ross, it's uh, wonderful advice. And what I hear from you is that uh, small uh, incremental changes uh, is the key here. So it's uh, uh, having a glass of wine. It's not depriving yourself of the things that you love. It's uh, ensuring that there's some exercise, ensuring there's moderation, ensuring that there's fruit and vegetables uh, in our diet. And, uh, and it gives us all a good hope uh, for a healthy uh, future. Now, if people want to stay connected with your messaging, Ross, uh, if they head to Dr. Ross Walker, uh, is it .com.au or .com? No, just, just .com and a, a shameless plug for my national radio show every Sunday night at seven o'clock on the Macquarie National Network. We can hear more of this stuff. And uh, So there's a lot of, uh, lot of your downloads in downloadable books that people can get off the website sure. and uh, we'll be posting this. Uh, for those that didn't take notes while they were writing. But uh, thank you, Ross. It's been wonderful to hear the simplistic, but such important messages uh, for all of us uh, to live a healthy life. And uh, uh, this very uh, mission that we're on uh, at the moment with the ride, we've uh, now clocked up over 40,000 kilometers. So I take some pride that HANS has led a community in bringing um, additional uh, exercise into their lives. So, mm. on behalf of all, thank you, Ross. Mate, can and, I just finish uh, off? Can, you, can I just finish off by just thank, thanking you and congratulating you on your wonderful work over the years and what you've done for the many children in Thailand. I think it's wonderful, and you and Kay and the, the work from Nata. It's been superb, and it's been a privilege for me to be involved in in some way. Thank you, Ross. Thank you. Over to you, CT. Thank you, Pete, and thank you, Ross. That was so interesting. Um, I saw like there was many comments coming up and, and I think you picked up all of the questions and, and Pete picked those up too. So thank you so much for giving your time um, to us on, on this beautiful Saturday. Um, I think there'll be a few people that are disappointed they missed this session, yeah. Um, but yeah, they can definitely catch it on our YouTube channel um, a little bit later today. So just to wrap things up, um, remember guys to jump on my virtual mission and log your kilometers. We have noticed a few people um, still sitting at zero. I have seen your names on the Zoom sessions. 
So if you're struggling um, or not sure how to load your kilometers onto my virtual mission, just shoot us an email and we, we're happy to help you out. Um, next week, we've got a brilliant lineup of interviews. Um, super excited. We've got some amazing guests on. We'll also be crossing live to a couple of the homes. Um, so we're going into that week three where motivation might start to wane a little bit. So uh, we've got some amazing things lined up next week. Um, and we've also got some fun planned for Throwback Thursday, um, including dress up, dancing, possibly a cooking de demonstration. So stay tuned. Um, check out the Ride to Provide Facebook group for all of the events and the details, and you'll get your weekly schedule uh, tomorrow night as well um, into your inbox. But for now, have an amazing weekend. Thank you again, Ross, for joining us today. And thanks, Pete. All the best. Thanks, Ross. All the best with the knee. Thanks, Ross. Lovely, lovely. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thanks, mate. Thanks, everyone.